So I laughingly call this celebrating over 100 uses for used beer bottles. Um, this was actually a picture I took last year when I was in China, and this is a small town where they're drying herbs that they harvested from their field on the roadside, and they're using these basically as traffic cones to stop you from running over the herbs. Um, and these kinds of practices, I'd say Chinese people tend to be very practical, um, uh, and so this is just kind of a silly but very practical use of empty beer bottles. Um, Doc Ng Hei, the Chinese physician who practiced at the Kam Wan Chang store, which is now a museum, um, from the late 1800s through when he broke his hip and was transported to Portland in the late 1930s. So he started in a time when, because of the gold rush, there were literally thousands of Chinese living in the second largest Chinatown in Oregon, which was John Day, Oregon, to the time when he and his partner were basically the last two Chinese left in town, um, which meant they had to transition their business. They had to serve a Western clientele eventually, hence the idea of using these beer bottles because every good Western man drinks his beer. So this is actually one of the few real items I have from the museum. That is the piece of paper he would give to his clients when he would write you an herbal formula, and basically he would tell you to boil it and put it in your used beer bottles and save the extras and then take your doses day by day. So 100 years of empty beer bottles and medicine, that's what we're here to talk about today. <laughs> so this is the actual museum building. Don't let this picture fool you, it is absolutely tiny. Um, when the gentlemen first showed up, they were not the original owners of this building. Um, it was actually built as like a way station, as a military post, in what was very much so the frontier at that time. Um, throughout the West, in California, in Oregon, in Idaho, in Montana, there was a gold rush in the late 1800s. People would find gold and then largely unmarried men would follow in droves to make their fortune really quick. Um, the characters for Ken Wa Chung is actually, I don't have them here, but it's Jin Hua Chang and, uh, and Mandarin. This is Cantonese. It means gold and then flower or flowering. And then Chang, the last word, means prosperity, but in this context, it actually usually relates to a kind of store. So it's a store celebrating golden flowering. But it's also a bit of a pun, because the idea is all these men are coming to find gold, the gold rush. And Hua is part of a compound, Hua Chao, which means the flowering bridge. And that was a Chinese term for the out-migration, the migrant populations from China. So it was also kind of a pun that could be you know, golden, flowering, prosperous store, or it could mean for the prosperity of the gold rush Chinese. Basically, come mm -hmm. here, buy your shovels, and you will make money. Um, yes. Um, this building is at John Day. This is at John Day. I've seen it. It looks familiar. Yes. Um, and so they purchased this property in the early days, and mostly that was where they resided. They cooked. Um, they dispensed medicines. It was a general store. And it, although the display is set up more like they sold individual items from looking in the record, actually they were more wholesalers. So the people would come in because again it's a very rural area. They come into town. They buy a giant lot of flour they take it back out to their farm. So they were really more wholesalers than they were the idea of like your corner drugstore. Because in the 1800s, it seemed like more and more Chinese would come to find more and more gold, they very ambitiously built this second layer, which they never in fact used. Because their anticipation was they would house hundreds of their brethren looking to come to Oregon to make their fortunes, put them up in a bunkhouse up there, but actually right around the time they built it is when the gold declined and so did Chinese populations mostly for their own safety. Um, the reason actually this large Chinatown is in John Day is because it had been in Canyon City just around the corner and they had gotten burned out by the white locals. And so they moved into an undesirable location in order to maintain their enclave and their safety. That being said, this is a very heavy, almost leaden door that's pockmarked with bullet holes because in the early days of their inhabitation of this town, the cowboys used to amuse themselves by shooting at Chinatown. That obviously changed because they chose to remain in the area, and as you saw from that English language instruction sheet, eventually most of their clientele became white locals. So who are these guys I'm talking about? There's two of them. You have Ng Dok Hei, he was the physician, and you have Long Ong. Long Ong was really the financial driver behind the business. He opened the first car dealership in Eastern Oregon. They had one of the first telephones in Eastern Oregon. He also very wisely opened the first gas station in Eastern Oregon. Um, he had multiple businesses, he was a gambler, he was a horse racer, and basically he fell in love with the West and he knew how to make money. So he was a very successful business person. 
They both came from very similar counties in South China, and I'm going to show you a map. And because of that kind of familial local connection, although they weren't blood related, when Ying Hei showed up, they went into business together. Um, at the time, again, they were ser serving a largely Chinese clientele, and they basically were importing their entire cultural milieu into this tiny little store. So they were providing a lot of services out of that little building. Everything from writing letters home, receiving letters from home, helping people find work, and also doing a lot of the more divinatory ancestor worship type stuff. So actually, from looking at the records, Ing Hei's early medical practice was just as much about shaking the I Ching and doing spirit writings for people as it was actually prescribing them herbal medicine. Over time, when they had a Western clientele, obviously he's not doing E.J. readings for the white people in town. He's actually just giving them herbal teas and ointments and balms, and we'll get into that. And you see these two white ladies in the photo, too. Obviously scandalous. There's a number of letters in the collection, particularly about Long An and some of his scandalous interactions with the women in town. Ing Hei was very chaste. He was a true Confucian, and so he would oftentimes uh, chastise his partner for some of his more... Um, lascivious ways and encourage a life of chastity. And within the realm of Chinese medicine, the idea is you want to preserve your health. And so some of those things are living in moderation, not drinking too much, not spreading your seed too far. Um, and so Ying Hei was definitely an advocate of that kind of life. He also, very practically speaking, had eye problems. And by the time he passed away, he was blind. Um, and from talking to people in the area at the end of his life, because it was such a small town and such a small building, they had built a, a line going from the front door of the building to the outhouse so he could feel his way along it, and then back to his chair. So he spent, from the three counties perspective, so this map is basically this part of China. So this part of China is where, you know, there are Chinatowns all over in the United States, Canada, Australia, even the entire western coast of South America. And most of those Chinese people immigrated from even a small area within this part of China. They came from around Guangdong province, and they moved all over the world. But in particular, within this small area, you have the three counties, four counties area. And how many of you have heard of Chinese tones? They're like gangs. So because they come from, again, this tiny little area within China, this part of the county does not like this part of the county. So oftentimes, within Chinatowns in America, this local conflict would play itself out as the three counties versus the four counties. And Ing He and Long Ong were from this area, so they considered themselves brethren against the other guys from the three counties. Um, so even though they met in America, really their sense of identity and their sense of mutual trust and responsibility and respect came from this understanding of their background. Both of them actually had wives, and Ing He had um, fathered a daughter before he left and he was not able to bring his wife over. And frankly, there's a fair amount of evidence that he didn't even really try. And I think one of the greatest mysteries of this story is for two men who seem like such good Chinese filial sons, why they didn't make some of the same choices as other men of their generation who tried really hard to bring their families over, or in the absence of the ability to do that, would even move back to China knowing that things were kind of falling apart. A lot of people would have their bones dug up and shipped back to China, and both of these gentlemen chose very intentionally to be buried in a beautiful place in John Day, Oregon, where they sit up on a bluff and they look down over the city. So they really embraced this country in a way, and I think that frontier identity, that not all immigrants of that story coming from South China embraced to the same degree that they did. So I have some books to pass around because I don't even, in an hour, I don't have nearly enough time to go over all the exciting parts of the story. So the first is um, this documentary, which we've actually screened in this room before. Um, it's available for streaming through OPB's website, or you can even go to like your local library oftentimes. It's about half an hour, um, and it's really very focused on the actual history of the museum, less so the medicine. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the medicine and say the history. Believe it or not, for all the history that I've done thus far. This is the only book that was ever written about the museum. And I'll just put these up here. Um, it was written by Jeffrey Barlow and his wife, which were the first two consultants after they opened the museum back up in the 1970s. And they have they had really open hearts and they really felt a sense of honoring their ancestors. They were super excited about it, but it was also kind of a pet side project for them. So although Jeffrey Barlow was an academic, that is not an academic book. 
And what that means is that unfortunately a lot of the first person interviews he got from people who knew Doc Hay as an adult, they did not retain the transcripts and there is no record of those conversations other than the anecdotes in that book, which is just a terrible loss, I have to say. Um, there's a handful of transcripts for people actually like Gary in the back row there who may have had interactions with him as a child, but not really enough to tell us a lot about what he was like as an adult, what was his thinking process, how did he act in his community. I brought along some other books if you're really feeling, and we have more tea in the back too if you guys want more tea. Um, there's, these are a little academic, but really fantastic, particularly if you're interested in the history of Chinese Americans in the Pacific Northwest and in Portland in particular. So this is a book actually, I, I mentor students in a research practicum where we spend basically a whole year going through archival items and translating and transcribing, and I'll get to that. I have them all read this book. It's really the gold standard book in terms of understanding the out-migration from that area of South China to the American West, drawn by gold. Um, this is a really, really good book about the history of our region. Um, to be even more specific, and actually I know um, Mary Rose Wong has done tours of Portland's Chinatown. In a similar vein to that one, this is actually the history of our Portland Chinatown. It also shows some of the demographic information for John Day, because particularly in those early years, John Day actually rivaled Portland as the largest Chinatown in Oregon. Um, as it got less and less safe and populations dwindled, people tended to gravitate towards larger urban centers for safety and the idea of actually creating a, an enclave of a meaningful size. Um, but this is a really, really good book about the development of Chinatowns in Oregon. I also, I just put up some of these from our library too. This book is a visual history of patent medicine. It's such a good book to look at, but unfortunately also like this book, it has no references in it. So I it just, it's so frustrating because I want to do more research, but then it just stops right there with the pictures. Um, so for any of you who want to do any kind of historical work, please cite your sources for anyone else who might want to follow in your path. Um, so this is actually a map from the front of China Doctor of John Day, and this shows the the, the rough area that John um, that Ng Hay served with his medicine. So here's John Day, and here's basically most of uh, Eastern Oregon. And in fact, from looking at his letters, he had clients in Idaho, he had clients farther up into Washington, because most of the business that he did was mail order. So how progressive is that in a day and age when people are riding over you know, dirt roads and a horse and a buggy, he is actually prescribing most of his medicine through the mail. Um, and that was a really smart move on their part. When people are isolated in rural communities and there's not effective antibiotics, there's not effective, really not very effective medicine at this time. We're talking pre-antiseptic technique where people are still carrying around leeches and bleeding people. Like there are options for medicine in this day and age, the late 1800s, kind of 50-50 if your doctor's gonna kill you or help you. So, um, when, when Doc Hay, when Doc Hay was, when the good doctor was building his practice, he started serving mostly Chinese and, you know, it's hard to substantiate without talking to contemporary folks, but it really seems like the pivotal event was there was a wealthy ranching family who had a son that basically got sepsis. You guys know what sepsis is? Um, he cut his arm really badly, presumably on some barbed wire and he was dying. It was clear that it, the infection was raging in his arm and was probably gonna kill him. And, out of, and this is true even in this day and age. Unfortunately, Chinese medicine is a last resort. Medicine always works better as a first resort. So if you're thinking about it, see it done sooner rather than later, but anyhow, they contacted the good doctor and he rode out there on his horse and buggy, sat by the boy's bedside for three days, 24 hours a day, applying plasters and giving him medicine, saved his arm and saved his life. And because of that, now the town has a different opinion of this outsider Chinese doctor. He saved the prince of the town. And so those kinds of things, both actually in China as well, where reputation is everything, I think completely changed the game for them. And then slowly, more and more of the locals, and by reputation, even more distal locals, started to take advantage of his services, and they would write him letters. So let me I'm gonna actually fast forward to one of these letters. Sorry. Where are they? So these are the kinds of letters. And if you practice Chinese medicine, you would be stunned that someone could write a formula on the basis of this. So he gets these letters. Kind sirs, my eye paint has give out, 
and my eyes are some better than when I left there. My eyes feel much better after using the powder. If you send powder and paint both, um, then I can eat and have some canned pears. And so on the basis of a letter like that, he would write a normal formula and send it to you in the mail. I've seen letters where, dear sirs, my wife's tongue has the white fur. Can you please send us medicine? I mean, presumably that's a candida of the mouth or yeast infection, but that's like, in Chinese medicine, we do all kinds of diagnosis, we do an interview, we do a pulse reading. Like, I am amazed that he was able to prescribe medicine to these people. However, when we look at his formulas, they're huge. He would write hundred herb formulas, which is way more than we normally do, so it makes me wonder if he wasn't kind of taking a shotgun approach to the problem, <laughs> not knowing what it was. So he's like, I'm going to throw all possibility out there and hope that something gets better. <laughs> I'd say that from the work that we've done with the museum, that's really the greatest mystery we're trying to solve, but we really need to transcribe enough of his formulas to get a sense of his style and his intentions. The good news is a lot of the handwritten formulas that he wrote actually have dates on them in the lunar calendar. And as you'll see, most of these patient letters are also dated. So potentially, we can match his prescriptions to the requests and see if we can suss out what he was thinking. I would say we're five years from getting to that level of the research, but I'm, I'm dying to know to try and figure out how he was thinking. Because I've had plenty of our more senior practitioners look at his formulas and be like, these are huge. What is he doing? But the reports, anecdotally, are that he was really, really successful. So clearly there was something going on there. So, taking you on a tour of the museum. So he would see people in this chair, he'd sit in this chair, he'd do pulse diagnosis on people if they came into the store. Right back here, behind that, again, iron bars, because robbery and shooting up the store was a big deal at the time, um, is his medicinary. And you can see he's keeping all of his formulas in old cigar boxes. Again, necessity is the mother of invention, just like the beer bottles. You know, they're a small frontier town. Um, he also had a number of pre-formulated formulas he could prescribe, and he also made some of his own formulas that he would prescribe. So sometimes he'd make something from scratch. A lot of times he'd already have a powder made up and he'd prescribe that kind of thing to a patient. Um, as I mentioned, in addition to serving a Western and Chinese clientele with traditional Chinese medicine, he also did that kind of divinatory stuff. So we found at least two books describing how you do basically an aging type casting for folks, which included both medical and social cultural advice. Um, and so they clearly provided these kinds of services as well as maintained a community shrine. And if you know anything about the history of Chinese medicine, then you know that ancestor worship actually figures into it. So part of the reason why you have reverence for your elders is so that out of displeasure they don't make you sick or poor. <laughs> so the idea of maintaining a family lineage of wellness through offerings of food and seeking their advice, this whole idea of that kind of continuity is really important and especially in the early days they absolutely serve that function. In Chinese medicine we don't differentiate mind from body and so those ideas of social health and wellness are deeply embedded into the whole experience of well-being and so they provided a lot of that service in what was obviously a really tense time considering the racism that they faced as well as Chinese exclusion for a culture that reveres the family. How many of you all know about the Chinese exclusionary laws? So in the 1880s the American government basically banned immigration from China. They said no Chinese can enter this country unless you are a male and you're going for one of two specific occupational types. One was student, and I'm forgetting the other one. So a lot of laborers lied and said that they were students when they weren't. But the one thing that was always true was only men, which meant they could never bring their families. They could never set up families here. So there's basically <coughs> generations of Chinese that were not allowed to be in this country because exclusion was not fully repealed until 1962. Oh. So if you wonder why um, we don't have, given our proximity, particularly in Portland and China, just like this huge explosion of Chinese culture, it's because of the direct and frankly racist policies of our government that were in place from 1880. They started to repeal it in the 1940s, but they still had quotas. So like say in 1948, when China was collapsing and we had this great fear of communism, and we had even American-born Chinese people who had gone home trying to come back to America, they issued 150 visas. 
So please be aware also of the fact that you haven't heard of Chinese medicine is largely because of these policies not allowing these people to have fruitful lives and children and build schools and all the things that go along with normal professions. So there he is, standing behind his counter. They had a large cutting board. This is for display. Most of these items probably would have been back on the shelves, and this would have been an area for compounding herbs together into formulas. And there's all of his stuff. They also, because they were a general store, they carried Western medicine. So they had the purgatives, they had swamp root, they had aspirin, they had topicals. At that time, it was really an eclectic field of medicine. You had chiropractors, you had naturopaths and homeopaths, you had Western herbalists, you had Chinese doctors, you had all kinds of people competing for attention, as well as more Western trained surgical doctors. So really, it was a free-for-all, and it was kind patient-centered care, well, West style. Um, and so um, they absolutely catered to that. They didn't just carry Chinese medicine at their store. So this is our student team working with the curator for the museum. It's actually an unusual museum because it's run by Oregon State Parks and Recreation. Um, in the end, because the property was in the middle of a park, and the reason it's preserved is actually going to demolish it to build the park, but someone had the foresight to go in and poke around, and they came out and said, whoa, 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 we can't, we can't mow this building over. It's, it's full of too much stuff. Um, and then it turned out, actually, that they had deeded that building to the city on the condition they turned it into a museum. So um, it really is a time capsule. The other thing to remember is because of the events of history in 1949 when the communists took over China, and then you have the Great Leap Forward, and then you have the Cultural Revolution, basically you have a lot of self-destruction at the hands of their own people in which records were burned, families were killed, family lineage information was destroyed. So this time capsule actually carries a record from the 1800s to the 1940s into the future like nothing else on the planet. There are no complete records like this. He was a pack rat, and it's to our advantage. So we have their business records, we have his formulas, we even have his herbal supplies. Like We have everything. We can reconstruct the story, so it's great. So what we do is we come, and as you can see, it's an archive, so even though we have all these old books, they're now kept in folders, they're numbered, they're labeled with the idea that all kinds of researchers can have access to this material. Because of its isolation, even with paved roads, it's still pretty isolated to get out to John Day. I would say that you know, people come out and make a pilgrimage and do like a little bit of dip, dip, dipping, and then they leave. And so one of the big things that we want to do is not only do more continuous accumulative research, but also digitize it. So that people who are interested in this material don't have to make the physical journey. They can actually look at pictures and do work remotely. So what are we looking at? There's all different kinds of records there. He had a small collection, I'd say maybe about yay high off the table, of medical books. Um, there's a story in Chan Dr. John Day where basically he learned everything he knew from a doc lead. That seems kind of specious to me based on the fact that he has a stack this tall of medical primers from the late imperial period. Most of them are mnemonic rhyming primers, which is to say you don't know anything about medicine, you buy this rhyming book and it will teach you how to prescribe herbs. Many of those books are stamped in the front, and they say Republican year 1912, Republican year 1914, which says to me he ordered them after the fall of the Qing Dynasty. I think that he was largely self-taught. Um, I also think that he did have interactions in his village community with other doctors, and he may have met someone along the way that really helped him with the pulse diagnosis, but I really get the sense that even like I as a practitioner, he learned from his patients. He started small, he did a little of this, did a little of that, read a bunch of books, and over time, and seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, he learned his craft. Um, so he did have these books. This one is actually one of the divinatory books, so basically you cast that I Ching and then it would give you a reading. Um, and these kinds of readings, one of the things you can tell when you go through, you'll find red pieces of paper like this, this is one of those readings. So if it's one of those, it always shows up on a red piece of paper. When you're sorting through piles of documents, you're like, this is all in crazy, squirrely Chinese. What is this stuff? So part of what we've done is help the archivist, who doesn't read any Chinese, to sort things out into meaningful piles so that you can separate the divinatory documents from the handwritten formulas and medical prescriptions, from the business documents, from all the stuff that you might write down in your life and not throw away because you're a pack rat. Um, so. Some of them are really nice like this, where they have these really lovely handwritten or hand block stamped, and so most of the students start with this stuff. Because as you saw me flash past, the handwritten formulas are very hard to read. Um, there's also, because they're medical texts, sometimes channel diagrams. Um, 
There's some question about did he do acupuncture? The answer is pretty categorically no. He was mostly a pulsologist and an herbalist. So he would read your pulse and he would prescribe you herbs. There's some anecdotal stories about him using um, manual techniques called gua sha, which is a scraping technique, and he'd use large coins and like scrape people on the back. Um, I have to share the story because it's so awesome, even though it's completely forward hand. Um, it didn't actually make it into the book because it couldn't really be verified. Um, they get a call one day and someone um, was in Prineville and they said, our friend got hit on the head. He's kind of dead, we think he's dead, but we really <laughs> need to talk to him. And can you please come right now? So log on and Doc K, they get in the wagon and they go out there and they're like, can you help our friend? And Doc K looks at him and basically the guy's in a coma. He's completely out, but I guess he's still shallow breathing. And he's like, he's, I can't do anything for this man. He's pretty much gone. And they're like, but you have to, because he knows where the money is. And apparently they like robbed a bank together and they buried the money somewhere. And he was the only one who knew where they buried it. They're like, you have to do something. So he's like, all right. And so if you practice Chinese medicine, you know, there's certain points that will revive you. There's one right here. There's some on the back of the neck. They make sense. They're really related to that CNS kind of area. So he basically applied a really rapid wash off technique to the back of his neck. The guy, <gasps> and his friends are like, Where's the money? And he says, behind the outhouse, and then died. <laughs> so I don't know if that's really true, but that's a story from a frontier doctor. Those kinds of things don't happen anymore. There is a gold behind the tree these days. Nobody. Um, yeah. um, but you'll notice that in these kinds of masks, like he has this guy holding up a hand, and there's a point here. It's really different than Western anatomy. And a lot of times when people look at this stuff, they, oh, Chinese medicine is not real medicine. They didn't even bother to learn about anatomy. But Chinese anatomy is a little different. And honestly, again, since these are practical primers, they're really not about considering the depth of the body. It's more about, I'm going to put a moxicone right here. Or actually, in this one, it's a dermatological test. So it's actually more about, if you have a sore right here, what does it mean? Location is really important. In Western medicine, it doesn't matter where your psoriasis is, it's psoriasis. But in Chinese medicine, it's actually really important where it is. Is it on the inner aspect of the arm? Is it on the outer aspect of the arm? Is it only on the top part of the body? So these maps actually relate more to regions and integrated concepts than specific anatomy. I love this. So this last year, I had one student who has great Chinese language training do um, several chapters from my favorite book. It's called The Wan Bing Huishun, which is to return to spring from 10,000 illnesses. And a lot of the patents he carried had this Chun in it, uh, return to spring. So this is the idea that you're going to renew your vitality through good medicine. Um, I don't know if you can read this. I'm going to read it out loud because it's really awesome. OK, so these are all cases, strange diseases. Ma Shishin was 50 years old. He was addicted to alcohol, constantly in pain, and drinking would not cause intoxication. Dregs exited from the anterior or orifice and excrement from the posterior. All six pulses were sunken and choppy. I gave him Sum Tong, adding Hai Jin Sha, Mu Xiang, Bing Lang, Wu Tong, and Tao Ren. After taking this, his condition improved. As for this man, much mock wine would render his chi reckless. Even after drinking a liter, he wouldn't stop. His yang was extremely empty, and over time, that causes dampness to accumulate and produce heat, which then cooks the blood. His yin was also greatly empty, and when both yin and yang are empty, both can be mended by correcting them. After this man's middle years ended, and it, when it was natural for yin and yang to become empty, he could only be kept alive for a short while due to his depleted constitution. If wine remained in the gu qi, qi from food and drink, for three months, then he would certainly die. And sure enough, he did. <laughs> <laughs> so on the one hand, this is like what we call an N of one case study, where, I mean, this happens right now. You can walk out of here and you can see someone who's living this lifestyle. So how do you treat them with Chinese medicine? This is a great little case study, but it's also a little bit of a morality play. As a doctor, I can only do so much for you, unless you are willing to meet me there, unless you are willing to live a moral life, unless you are willing to be observant about your behavior, surely you will die, because at a certain point, you only have a capacity to heal, you only have a capacity to process, and he did. So there's also some a moral there. You're welcome. Another book that I found recently that was totally fascinating was this one. 
Um, and as I mentioned, it was a time of kind of extreme racism and hostility to the Chinese. And this is actually a testimony by a different Chinese physician in front of the Federal Trade Commission trying to explain why we're not hurting people with this medicine. And actually, when you look at the list of conditions in the front where we can be helpful, they're the same issues we face today. Cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, diabetes. What we do has few side effects and they can be extremely helpful. And he went before the Federal Trade Commission in order to make a case for our medicine. However, because of the climate of the times, we were not allowed to organize into a profession, we were not allowed to build schools, and we were not allowed to have the same legitimacy that the AMA was building for itself at the same time. And in fact, Doc He was one of the many Chinese doctors who was attacked by physicians and members of the American Medical Association in his day for practicing without a license. In some cases, as in Idaho, um, a very, uh, I don't know, very bold and uh, persistent Chinese doctor was actually allowed a medical license. He fought for it and obtained one. He was one of the only ones. Some were completely put out of business by lawsuits or driven underground. In the case of Doc Hay, when this came up for them, um, because it's a small town and they were well loved, they couldn't get the judge to show up to court and no one would sign up for the jury. So even though they actually brought it to court, court didn't show up for them, and so the whole matter just kind of got brushed under the table. <laughs> Um, but they did, in fact, try and basically stop him from practicing medicine because he didn't have a license. In spite of clear attempts by people within their profession to try and have those things built for themselves. It actually wasn't until after James Reston went to China on the Nixon opening up of China Brigade, had an emergency appendectomy, got acupuncture for the pain, and wrote about that, that this new eye got turned on our profession and was able to organize and have standardized testing and have accredited schools and licensure and all that. The interesting part is, for all these years, they're herbalists. But because of Reston's experience with acupuncture, that's why we're called acupuncturists. And you know that we do acupuncture and blah, blah, blah. But if you actually go to China, the herbalism is the dominant practice. It's the practice that's been in the United States the longest. It's the one that has the deepest roots and honestly, some of the greatest effects. Um, however, we are licensed acupuncturists. Thank you, James Preston. <laughs> so these are the handwritten records. So even if you don't read Chinese, you know that that looks confusing. Yeah. And when I show that to Chinese people, they do the same thing. That is hard to read. And so although everyone really, really, really wants to know what did Doc K prescribe, this is how we find out, and it takes a long time to translate these. They are very hard to read. They're not impossible, though, because one, they're herbal formulas, so they follow a certain pattern. It's basically herb, dosage, herb, dosage. So from that, you can kind of suss it out. We're also extremely lucky that he kept pretty good records. And so you have something up here that's usually an indication of a person's name or a location. So they had transliterations of some of the small towns around there. And that's one thing I'd like to do is make a glossary of all of those. Um, because you can actually locate and, again, refer to the patient letters and find out, OK, it's on this date from this location. It must be in reference to this letter. And then you also will have a date in the lunar calendar year that's very specific to the month and the day of the year, so we can actually date them to a day. Um, and then occasionally dosage information, or basically, um, and I think it was almost like a little prayer or like a little stamp, where at the very end of it it'll say, you know, for the greatest good benefit formula, or you know, for their good fortune formula. So I think it was just like his little way of giving them a good wish along with the medicine that was supposed to make them feel better. So this is actually, was one of the greatest coups from a native speaker last year. So after you see all of these, you have this kind of repeating weird squiggle. And we, I knew it was dosage, but I have never seen a character like that before. We were all baffled. And it's because, thank you, Long On, they were using a shorthand accounting system called the Sujo counting system. So this is e fun, which is a really small, like one fun, very small measurement. And it's written like this, which is actually a character that means to go down or below. But in the Sujo counting system, this character means this. Oh, we were so grateful when we figured this out. And then we found several versions of the way that this stuff is written. And so now we know that when we see these particular squiggles, as I suspected, they relate to specific weights and measures. So the formula will have the dose and then the weight measure. But the weight measure is in the shorthand counting system. Um, so again, just adds another layer of complexity to the translation. So um, most of the students thus far, and we've actually gotten almost all the way through it, have done the single herb records. So we either have the labels on these boxes, or we have the backstock inventory, which is largely in brown paper bags. 
And so we're translating everything and looking to kind of weed out redundancies because they were wholesalers, so they'll have 20 bags of the same thing. But in our wiki, that's just one entry for that one thing within all of the item numbers listed under that. And just because Chinese is confusing, it also dates his materials. In modern Chinese, they write from left to right, but pre-1949, they wrote from right to left. So each one of these boxes is actually read this way. So that's something that, again, common sense has to dictate, and depending upon a person's language facility, they're either less or more lost by that. Um, but you also can see where when they make a transition into the 1940s, you can almost you know, visually date items because they'll have a plastic cap on them, or they'll have other things that say, oh, clearly this comes from a later period. I love this one. So this is uh, Hong Kong marching powder. In their collection, they have something called Li Lu, um, which is a strong purgative. It makes you vomit. This was a kind of preparation that you would squirt up your nose and it would make you sneeze. We basically don't use these kinds of formulas anymore because first of all, no American would sign up for that. And second, you get into some ethical concerns around making someone vomit a lot on purpose or sneeze a lot on purpose. But this was actually a headache formula, with the idea that you squirt it up your nose, it would cause a sneezing fit, and then your headache would go away. <laughs> and he actually used a lot of those kinds of things, which are not so commonly used today. Um, he had a number of versions of this really common formula for women's health, and a lot of his women's health formulas are based on this. And these are just shots from our herbal formula of, these are three draining herbs, and these are three supplementing herbs. And so this is like a root formula that he had either the ingredients to make it raw, or he had it already prepared in a prepared form, or he had it already prepared in a fresh form. He had like multiple versions of this formula. And it's actually true today that for women's health, it's a base formula for so many different things. So those are actually characters? These are not characters. These are herbs. These are actual herbs. Actual herbs. Okay. These are actual herbs. <laughs> um, and it's because we use the Tai Chi yin yang balance idea, <laughs> even the formula itself is balanced with an herb to <coughs> nourish a particular organ and then help drain and move that organ and then nourish a particular organ and then drain and move so that. So this is ginger on the bottom? No, this is zishia. Um, it's, n none of these are probably herbs that you would ever oh, have used. I didn't look familiar. This is, um, this one's shanyao, so that's wild mountain yam. And this one's fuling is poria or sometimes called a uh, china root. Um, and these are all more tonifying, well, these are all draining, draining in the sense that they help you lose water weight. Um, and these are all tonifying, they tonify specific organs related to blood production in Chinese medicine. And so there's balance within the formula on several fronts. And it's really commonly used. We found a bunch of different iterations of it in the museum. So these are being used today by? Yeah, we still use the formula today. Stay. Yes. Um, we use a lot of these formulas today. In fact, I have examples. For those of you who have been drinking the tea, yes. this is actually something we found in his collection. They've been selling this particular patent medicine for over 100 years. So we had boxes of it in his storage. And I bought this from the Wing Wing Grocery on 82nd within the last few months. So a lot of these are tried and true family recipes that you can still buy today. Um, another one of which we found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these is you eat oil. This is a trauma liniment. It's for aches and pains and sore joints. Your low back hurts, your knee hurts, you're working in the field, you've stressed out your muscles. Um, yeah. And this is just an over-the-counter ointment. We have a variety, it's like kind of like tiger balm, but better, it's got more herbs in it. Um, you eat oil, we still use it today. Another one that we found, Balfalon, this is for food stagnation, indigestion. It's the formula that you take when you ate too much at Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. So these were things that were available then, we still use them now, they still have the same utility. And where is this uh, market? The Wingman market is on 82nd. <coughs> Do you know where Fubon is? Mm, it's between Division and Powell. Yeah, yeah. Well, right now. Um, but there's all different kinds. So you know, you have pre-made um, like powders, you also have little pills. This is actually an eye patent. For eye problems, we found a lot of requests for eye formulas. He was going blind, and he had a couple books about eye stuff. So we're still not clear: was it because it was self-care, or because it was actually a really common problem in the you know dry, high desert? So we're less clear if he had so much eye stuff because it was self-care, or because he was caring for his community. So this is actually an Asian market. I've been to a couple of Asian markets. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of time. Eight, eight seconds, kind of like a new Chinatown. Mm -hmm. So. Part of the reason I'm having you drink this tea is one, it's got a hundred herbs that have been long cooked into tea leaves, and the tea leaves are scorched and charred, and then that makes the tea. 
when I describe that to you, you're like, what? That's not what it tastes like. Sounds like gunpowder to you. But that's kind of how they make it, and it's 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 a panacea. It's a prophylactic. It's supposed to help you not get sick and fall. There's a little bit of honey. Yeah. Isn't there? That's really oh, tastes good though. It's a secret good. formula. I know it. Excuse me. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. But the cool thing is, and, and this is really a holdover from the olden days. If you're going to try and sell a product in the 1800s, and you, first of all, you want to make all your own profit from your product. You have this great product, and you want to make sure that no one's counterfeiting it. You also want to guarantee freshness, quality, blah, 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 blah. Well, before the days of the childproof seal and the FDA testing and all of that, how they did it in ancient China was kind of through branding. So you see all the seals and everything on the packaging. That's one way to guarantee this has not been tampered with. A lot of it, too, is about you know, having a certain seal on it that says this is a legitimate seal, a legitimate producer, and if you see in a different color, then you know someone faked it. And you see this in this package a little bit, but you see it in all kinds of packaging. <clears throat> There's packaging within packaging within packaging. And again, it's just more of that guarantee that this is really what you thought you signed up for. Um, but this one's so cute. So you have this big box, and it's full of all these little boxes, which have all the directions wrapped around them in this intricate thing and glued down. Then you have to peel that off. And then there's another little box that looks like the big box inside with the tea in it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but all of that, again, was really for quality assurance, oh safety, God. and that guarantee that this has not been counterfeited. Oh so here's that patient letter I read. Here's my other favorite patient letter. I posted this on my Facebook page to many alike. Um, Canyon City, Oregon, 1906. This is to certify that I, the underside, have quit taking the medicine from the American doctors of this county, and it is my desire to employ the China doctor of John Day to give me medicine, signed with three witnesses. <laughs> so just in case there was any question or concern that he was not of sound mind and body when he was like, I'm done with this medicine that's hurting me, and I'd like to take the Chinese medicine, three witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor out of trouble. Um, so this is the wiki that I've talked about. So basically what I've been doing for the last three years is building out this wiki where we have we have the books, there's actually some catalogs for ordering medicines, um, patent medicines, bulk herbs, and then formulas. And we will go into, the museum has a database, but it's secure, so not everyone can see it, it's password protected. It also has this other problem, which when we first started working together, it was just like, oh, are you kidding me? It doesn't support Chinese language software. So if they want to do any of their own app entries into their own database, they can't use any Chinese. Which to me is like, as we continue to do this work, that's what I want to give to them, and there's no place to put it in their own system. So with the first grant that I got around this, we, we purchased an upgrade so we can access it remotely. So the students have access to the database. We created a spreadsheet where we've gone through all the pictures and been like high quality, low quality, patents, because the entries themselves say box, comma, medical, box, comma, medical. That could be anything. So we've gone through and created a little more detail so that we can target our searches. And we've just been going through by category. I'll give a student a category. They'll approach the problem, look at it as far as they can. I counsel them, you're never going to get to the end of this. This is going to take decades. So <laughs> just do what you can. Um, and so we've gotten mostly through single herbs. So this is a single herb. Now consider that this picture is of an herb that was put into a paper bag probably sometime in the 1930s, and it still doesn't look like mold. It looks like herb. Part of it is because of the way they're dried and prepared, but it's also because John Day is high desert, and the high desert preserves things. I mean, we owe the desert a gift. Otherwise, if this had been important, this stuff would all be mold. It'd be gone, you know? Um, and so the students will go through, and these are relatively simple because they're just a single herb, but they'll list the characters, they'll list the Chinese, they'll list the English, and then as we build it out, we might put more and more information about the herbal usages. Are we doing this work there in John Day? No, we're doing it remotely because I got access to the database and the wiki's online. So I go to John Day, and when I first started, yes, I had to do it all in John Day. But now, because of the internet and digital systems and remote access and wikis, we don't have to. Where exactly is the college? Is it in another school? The college is right around the corner, Oregon mm -hmm. College of Oriental Medicine. This is all online. A separate college from like Portland, University of Portland. Or yeah, we're our own school. We're a Chinese medicine school. school. So yeah. we're never aware of it. Yeah, and we have information about the school in the back, so you're welcome to take stuff about our clinics. We actually do herbal-only consultations, which is $10 to get a, a custom formula written for you. Our acupuncture is very affordable. I encourage you to take some information. We also have specialty clinics, so if you have specific conditions, we have a whole list of our specialty clinics. And I'm a doctoral student, so I can actually, for once, say, I could potentially be your intern, because in the past I had not been working for the school, but now I do on Sundays. 
So how hard is it to get in there? Get in, like, <laughs> in, in, in to see someone in there or talk to someone? Very easy, you just have to have the information. So please take one okay. of the clinic brochures that's back there, and um, yeah, I encourage you just to make an appointment. You can make a phone call. Are you call. open seven days? We're open, we're open six days at our Cherry Blossom location. We're open five days downtown, with the exception of the Sunday specialty clinics. So once a month, we're open, especially on Sundays, for condition-specific clinics with our doctoral students. Where is Cherry Blossom? Cherry Blossom is out by Mall 205. It's our old campus. The campus downtown is a new campus. That there should be, do we have the clinic brochures back there? Uh, do they have ones that say healthcare services? This one talks specifically about the Okay. Our information should be on those mm -hmm. things. Anyhow, mm -hmm. let me, mm -hmm. about four minutes, let me get through, and then we have all kinds of information we can mail and I can write things down for you too. So, this is actually the wiki. If you got a handout, and I have extra handouts if you'd like a handout in my presentation. Yeah. Sorry, the two ladies that started with me. Took off and put it down there. Um, so the listing for the wiki is there, and basically, if you're if you're a member of the public, you can't edit it, but you can certainly peruse it. Um, if you're curious, you're welcome to look at any of the items that are there. The idea is that this is just a, a tool for additional research or exploration. It's not a lot of explanatory detail. It's just a way to make this stuff as we transcribe it accessible to the to anyone who might be interested in working with the material. Um, and so really the two big people that have been working on this is me and then the, uh, I can't say enough about curator Christina Sweet. Um, she has the perfect kind of background. She, for a large part of her life, kind of did docent and touring kind of work and then for the other half she built archives. And so the John Day Museum is actually only open pretty much through the summertime into early fall, at which point they close and then they do the back end archival work. So she spends about six months a year going through labeling, dating, sorting, storing, quantifying, mm -hmm. photographing, and doing all of that. And then springtime comes, and they run tours all day long. And that, I believe, is seven days a week. The other thing about the tours is they're all free. So if you do go visit the museum, because this is entirely supported by local friends of Cam Ha Chung and people like me that volunteer my time, I'm doing this as a volunteer. The students are doing it for credit. They're not getting paid. Pretty much everyone that is given love to preserve that site and the interpretive center They've done it mostly out of love. So if you do get a free tour, I encourage you to leave a little something in the donation bucket because that does help us to build out more of the displays. Yeah, and this one's for here too. Um, I'm guessing, but that's for the garden. That's actually for the garden. Yeah. Um, I gave you some reading recommendations. If you shut up a little late, these are the two books that I recommend that you read. Um, and here is a link. Sorry, the copy link that's for students, so ignore that one. And that's written in this. Document. Yeah. Um, but this is a link to the wiki. So if you would like to see the fullness, we have chapters of books, we have pictures, we have a whole bunch of patent medicines, we have some of his personalized formulas. Um, the formulas are a little difficult because there's not the diagnosis attached to it, so it's just like a list of herbs, but if you're a practitioner, it might be more meaningful to you. Um, it's so interesting that we saw this building 15 years ago when we were in our room. I had no idea what was going on there or ever went on there. Yeah. It was really interesting. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that concludes my talk for today. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you so yeah. much for coming. And what is your name? My name is Beth Howard. Yeah. And I'll be available and have tea and stuff back there. We can answer questions and look at materials. And thank you so much. Thank you. Right, thank you. Interesting.